Hello, my guest today is Dr. Tim Smith, physicist, expert on particle physics and physics data management, and the head of collaboration and information services at CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research. Welcome, Dr. Smith, and thank, thank you, you very much. much for accepting our invitation. Um, CERN's Large Hadron Collider generates an enormous volume of data every second. Your storage system capacity is about 100 petabytes. How do you handle with all that LHC uh, data? What is the workflow behind it? So in fact, the amount of data that we store is a small fraction of the amount of data that we generate in the collider itself. Because the collisions uh, of our particles that, that uh, counter-rotate and then collide at each of the experimental uh, areas happen 40 million times per second. And each detector itself comprises something like 150 million sensors. So if you multiply those two numbers up, then you get petabytes per second of data flows out of, of uh, the detectors around the collision point. And there's just no way that we could uh, store or analyze that data. So in fact, the, the data pr um, processing workflow starts right at the, uh, the side of the detector, where we have dedicated silicon um, that we've, we've uh, programmed ourselves to, to actually do the filtering process to bring the rate of, uh, of data flowing out from the petabyte per second down to terabytes per second. Um, we then pass it into a pipeline, which uh, are commercial, uh, commercially available PCs, which are not far from the detectors, but they're, they're actually in a, in a proper computer control, controlled area, computer center. Um, and thousands of processors then process the data real time and reduce the, uh, the data by selecting um, the interesting events, reduce the data flow from the terabytes per second down to uh, gigabytes per second. And it's that that we actually transport over optical fiber to the computer center in CERN and record. So there's a whole uh, workflow that's gone on, and our analyses have to take account of the algorithms by which we are selecting um, at both of those, uh, the, the triggering and the filtering stages. Uh, when dealing with big data, uh, we realize the challenge is not only the storage itself, but also uh, the proliferation of data as a result of reuse, for example. Uh, as well as uh, obsolescence of media on which uh, these data is kept. Uh, what is CERN's strategy uh, for the long-term uh, data preservation? So we've been running experiments uh, with digital readouts for quite some time. And in the early years, we allowed each experiment to take uh, the data on whatever media they wanted. Uh, and then in the Compute Center, we had an example of the reader for each of these uh, storage media to make sure that we could continually read the data from the experiments. But over time, this became harder and harder to keep each of these different technologies alive. So we've now gone into a strategy whereby we, we copy the data from wherever it was, on whatever media it was recorded, onto the latest technology. We have massive uh, storage uh, robots, tape robots, in which we copy all the data. And we have a, a plan of migrating it each three to five years to the latest tape technology, always keeping in the same uh, storage enclosure, the same robots, so at least we, uh, we have a good uh, capital investment there and recovery of the, the costs over 30 years, hopefully. Um, but the, the media themselves are, are changed regularly to make sure that we, uh, we profit from the increased capacity that industry is capable of providing for each of these media. So this means that we actually have to uh, continually be reading the data back out of the data stores and copying it onto the, n the latest technologies. Because the, the, uh, the way that we do the f physics analysis is actually from the disks, the, the disk caches. But the disk caches are not big enough to, uh, to store all of the data. So we write it onto the, uh, the permanent storage media, the tapes, and then we populate the caches with the data that's being read and analyzed by the physicists at the moment. So we're forever um, updating the caches from tapes, but not necessarily reading all of the tapes. So what we've found now, actually, is that we have to, um, as a background process, be reading the tapes continuously to exercise the data, because we've found that uh, the, the phenomena of bit rot happens, unfortunately, if you don't actually look, you don't see until the moment it uh, becomes critical, 
that the data is no longer accessible. And there are 101 reasons why your data may not be there, even if you've successfully stored it um, and you, you have checksums to check when it comes back that it's the same, it may not be, uh, have been uh, successfully stored there. So we actually have the migration programs and we have the uh, data exercise programs to make sure that what we're putting there, bit by bit, is uh, available later. But again, that's not sufficient because, of course, you need uh, format transformations as well and, and all sorts of higher level operations on the data, uh, which is a whole other problem. So CERN not only uh, generates huge amounts of data, but makes uh, this data open. And uh, to allow uh, reusability, you need not only to open the data, but to make them retrievable and searchable and meaningful. Uh, what do you do at CERN to, to, to make these data useful? So in fact, uh, the open data portal that we put out recently was a, a collaboration, a very strong collaboration between the library um, with all of the, uh, the metadata experts and the IT department um, with the technical experts. So this uh, joining together has been addressing exactly the point that you made, which is we needed the expertise um, to understand what we had to put into the data to make it discoverable later, to, uh, to work out how we describe it so that, so, so that it can be more usable um, and interoperable uh, between the systems that store the information, not necessarily the data itself. That we don't do many data transformations at the moment, although for outreach purposes, where we know that it's going to leave our field and definitely be used by, uh, by people who have nothing, uh, no knowledge and no access to the tools within our field, then we do uh, data transformations. We're trying to make uh, tools that accompany the data, um, explanations of the data formats, such that people can use them in completely different uh, environments to our own. For our own data, we, because it's so massive, um, and uh, we've written the data formats specifically for optimized analyses within our uh, own field, we tend to leave them in those formats and then supply the software that we have used to analyze to make that openly available so other people can use either the software alone or virtual machines containing the software to access our data. And then if they want to extend it, then they extend basically the code that we have supplied um, rather than writing their own from scratch, which anyway would be uh, quite unfeasible considering the, the enormity of the, the enterprise. Um, so I would like to ask you now about the reuse of uh, data that uh, CERN produces outside physics. Reportedly, there are many spin-offs uh, in medicine, for example, that use the data you generated. And uh, do you track this reuse in, uh, in disciplines uh, that are different to physics? Uh, do you expect broad into disciplinary reuse of, of uh, certain data? So in fact, no. I, we would always love people to, uh, to find new uses. Um, but because it's frontier research, uh, the prime motive for taking the data is to understand the universe. The information is stored and, and saved for that purpose um, and it's hard to imagine that it could be used into a completely alien environment of, uh, of normal uh, uh, life without something that we're not thinking of at the moment basically. So some other insight I, I think is unlikely. So what we expect more is that, uh, that people will find other uses um, for training their algorithms, for understanding the techniques that we've used and applying those techniques elsewhere. So it's more as an, as an education ground, a, a training ground, uh, it's just having data of that volume available to, uh, to move it around, to, uh, to, to test things on. Uh, so that's what we expect more than actually someone getting some insight in their daily lives from the data itself. Uh, as for repositories, uh, CERN is running Zenodo, and it was built in collaboration with Open Air Project. Uh, what's your assessment of, of, of the project? Is it working efficiently? Uh, is there anything you would like to improve? So the Zenodo was started as a quite a small-scale uh, idea. 
to support the EC Commission's uh, pilots, the open access pilots, start with and then the open data pilot, as a sort of catch-all to make sure that they could put a policy up to ask people to comply with, knowing that there is somewhere that they could comply if they didn't have somewhere else as an institute to deposit things or a subject repository. So it was a small-scale thing as a catch-all. But once we'd put it up there, we saw the enthusiasm of people to, uh, to use services that were actually usable, um, that they started to ask us for more and more features. And so we now have the problem that, in fact, we, we're, we're failing to keep up with all of the interest and all of the, the, uh, the new ideas that could be built on top um, that would create new opportunities for different sciences and, uh, and different reuses. So we, we're really keen to make it grow quickly, but at the moment, it's, it's literally uh, a question of getting enough people to actually do the, uh, the, uh, the programming of the services to accept the, uh, the new use cases. So my final question would be, um, let's imagine that you are asked to uh, convince, to encourage scientists to, to, to open their data. What would you say? What would be uh, sort of incentive uh, or bait to, 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 to catch them? I think the message is about the scientific, scientific process. I think this is the driving uh, force that will be appreciated by most of the, the scientists. The, the process that we've evolved over the last few hundred years uh, involves the communication of our ideas and the testing of those ideas, the falsification of those ideas by others. So the sharing of the data is just another part of that uh, communication. It's the uh, the, the, the tools and the materials that we're using every day that we want to be communicating, exposing, showing to everyone such that they can take a look, they can help, they can build on it, they can uh, improve it. Uh, they can help us by saying the things that weren't right in it. This is the normal process and I think on that level the scientists appreciate that, that they can benefit um, from themselves and their, and their own research from the sharing. But I think it has to be done in a layered approach. So you don't just say, throw it over the wall, doesn't matter what happens to it, you don't know where it is and, and who's going to do what. I think the layered approach says that the scientific data can be opened up to your immediate uh, colleagues or the colleagues that follow you down the line in your research uh, once you have moved on. Or it's the colleagues that are in other countries that are doing similar research. And each of these levels of opening up um, makes them more and more uh, comfortable, they see the benefits, and then finally, uh, perhaps only when the, the publication happens, might they be comfortable with uh, opening the data up further. Uh, so I think the, the message that it will help them is the most uh, powerful message uh, that we'll get through. Dr. Smith, thank you very much for your time and for this interesting talk. You're welcome.